Some people, after they hear me talk for a little bit, decide that maybe I'm not really from Alabama after all. And it is true, I haven't quite learned the language yet. But I came to Alabama back in 1990. I was there for some Air Force Reserve duty, and I learned about the Thomas Good Jones School of Law, a school that is part of Faulkner University, and which says in its statement of purpose and philosophy that law is the foundation of society and biblical truth is the foundation of just law. And I decided that's the kind of law school that I'd like to associate with. And so I talked to the dean and asked for a position. And one of the first things that they wanted to know, though, was, well, we really would kind of like to have somebody from the South. Are you from the South? So I said, well, of course I'm from the South. I was born in the South. And then they asked me where, and I had to say South Dakota. <laughs> but it's been four years now, and they tell me that next semester I may be able to start teaching my classes without an interpreter. So I guess we've fit in there quite well. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of representing our law school at the convention of the Association of American Law Schools. They held their convention out in San Francisco that year. And while I was there, I drove on the Pacific Coast Highway, and I was impressed particularly by the Spanish missions that I saw there. Possibly what intrigued me most was the dates in which those missions were established. Dates like 1776, 1783, 1787, and the like. And what struck me was that God was at work on the West Coast and the East Coast both. At the time when these missions were being established on the West Coast to tell people about Jesus Christ, on the East Coast, Christians were talking about independence and constitutions. Now, which one of these really represented the will of God? I'd say both. God was using different people in different ways at this time because God had a plan in the establishment of America. He had a plan to bring the gospel to the Western Hemisphere and to establish a society that is built upon biblical principles of government and of economics, not only for the well-being of those who live here, but also as a light and an example to the rest of the world. Let me emphasize as we speak about this that I do not believe America is the kingdom of God, but it is the best the world has to offer. And the reason it's the best the world has to offer is because it is built upon principles that are consistent with the word of God. Obviously, to simply say that Columbus discovered America in 1492 is a bit of an oversimplification. As one Native American chief put it, we knew who we were, and we knew where we were, and we didn't need to be discovered. And he has a point, in a sense. Many people were here in America before Columbus. Columbus wasn't even the first European to come to America. There were people from many other places. We know for a certainty, I think now, that Vikings were in America about 1000 AD. The Viking sagas had attested to that for centuries, and there was some question whether to believe them until the Lonzo Meadows sites were discovered in Labrador. And when these were discovered by Dr. Ingstad and carbon dated back to 1000 AD with Norse artifacts, I don't think that anybody today really questions that Vikings were in America about 1000 AD. One of the things that might surprise a lot of people is that the Vikings who came to America at that time were for the most part Christians. That's a surprise because when we think of Viking, we usually think about the worship of Thor and Odin. We don't usually think about Christianity, but in fact, the Viking explorations here, according to the sagas, came right after the Christianization of Scandinavia. King Olaf Tryggvason, around 990 AD, had become a Christian and Christianized the rest of Norway, partly by preaching, which he did very powerfully, and partly by wielding the sword, which he also did very powerfully. 
But whether you like his methods or not, he was a strong evangelist. There was a Viking chieftain from Iceland named Eric Thorvaldsen, who, because of a quarrel, he was declared an outlaw. And one of the principles of Norse law was that the local althing or parliament or jury that found you guilty could find you guilty, but they didn't have the authority to punish you. That was left to the relatives of the person you injured. What they would do, though, is they would declare you an outlaw, which meant you were outside the protection of the law. And Eric had been declared an outlaw, which meant that he wasn't safe in Iceland anymore, so he had to get out of Iceland, so he decided to go west and sail to Greenland. I had the privilege of backpacking in Greenland some years ago and see the ruins of Eric's Hall and of Theodhild's church and some of the old Viking ruins there. But Eric had a son there named Leif. We know him today as Leif Erikson. And when Eric was a young man, he went to spend a winter with King Olaf in Norway. After all, he was king over all of this area and a local chieftain would send his son to spend some time with the king because he'd be a direct servant someday. And we read according to Eric's saga that King Olaf preached Christianity to Leif and that Leif accepted Christianity. And then we read, on one occasion, the king had a talk with Leif and said, are you intending to sail to Greenland this summer? Yes, Leif replied, if you approve. I think it would be a good idea, said the king. You are to go there with a mission from me to preach Christianity in Greenland. Well, Leif did so, came to America, and we read that he had once begun preaching Christianity and the Catholic faith throughout the country. He revealed to the people King Olaf Tryggvason's message, telling them what excellence and what glory there was in this religion. By the time Leif was ready to sail for America, Greenland was pretty thoroughly Christianized, and the expedition that took place contained some Christians and some Thor worshipers as well, but mostly Christians. And yet, the Vikings, while they were in Greenland for about 500 years, they were in North America for only a few years, and then they fade into the mists of history. They go back to Greenland and Iceland and Norway, and the impact that they left upon the Western Hemisphere was almost non-existent. I think there's a reason for that. While they had a tremendous interest in evangelizing their own people, they showed very little interest in evangelizing the Native American population, those whom they called Skrelings. And that's probably why their colonization was doomed to failure. It has to be said that Columbus brought the Eastern and Western hemispheres together in a way that they could never be separated again. And in that sense, it is appropriate to call Columbus a discoverer of America. There's another mistake that many people make about Columbus, and that is to say that Columbus proved that the world was round. Well, I'm not part of the Flat Earth Society, don't misunderstand me, but no educated person in 1492 had any doubt that the world was round. In fact, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans knew the world was round. Aristosthenes, about four or five hundred years before Christ, had calculated the circumference of the earth and had calculated it with amazing accuracy. In fact, even the Bible, going back hundreds of years before that, in the Old Testament, speaks about the circle of the earth. And the Hebrew word that is used there for circle actually could be better translated globe or sphere which shouldn't be all that surprising because the God who inspired scripture also created the world and probably had it figured out that the world was round. <laughs> Columbus's debate with the Talavera Commission there in Portugal and the Salamanca Commission in Spain was not over whether the world was round or flat. It was over the size of the earth. And there, quite frankly, Columbus was wrong. He misunderstood what the ancients meant when they spoke about a degree of longitude and latitude, and therefore he underestimated the circumference of the earth by about 25%. He 
He also overestimated the size of the continent of Europe and Asia. And he got that from reading Marco Polo, and I can understand that. Living in Alabama, we have horses, and I love to ride. I could ride all day, but I think if I rode a horse all the way from Italy to China, I'd probably overestimate the size of Eurasia, too. And that's exactly what Marco Polo did, and Columbus perpetuated that error. And so Columbus then thought that the distance from Spain to sail west across the Atlantic and reach China was about what the distance actually is to go across the Atlantic and reach the United States. So no wonder when he landed on what is probably Watling Island on October 12, 1492, and saw darker-skinned people there, he called them Indians, because he thought he was on islands that were off the coast of Asia, and if his calculations had been correct, that's exactly where he would have been. Another myth about Columbus is that Columbus came solely for the purpose of getting rich or getting fame or power. Columbus's real purpose in coming to this Western Hemisphere is a purpose that he sets forth very clearly in his own book, a book that he wrote late in life, and a book that he calls the Book of Prophecies. It was the Lord who put into my mind to sail to the Indies. There is no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous illumination from the Holy Scriptures. He goes on to say, the Holy Scripture testifies in the Old Testament by the prophets and in the New Testament by our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that this world must come to an end. The signs of when this must happen are given by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The prophets also predicted many things about it. Our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, said that before the end of the world, all things must come to pass that had been written by the prophets. For the execution of the journey to the Indies, I did not make use of intelligence, mathematics, or maps. And his critics would probably agree with that statement. It is simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah prophesied. These are great and wonderful things for the earth, and the signs are that the Lord is hastening the return. The fact that the gospel must still be preached to so many lands in such a short time this is what convinces me. There is his statement of his purpose, preaching the gospel. And why is he so concerned about that at this time? Because Columbus, like many of those who lived in the 15th century, believed that he was living in the last days before the return of Jesus Christ, and that before Jesus returned, the gospel must be preached to every land. Now put yourself in the place of a European Christian in 1492, believing that the gospel needs to be preached to the rest of the world. What's the rest of the world? In your view, then, it's going to be Africa and Asia, because you don't know that North and South America exist. Now think about it again from their standpoint. What is the main barrier that stands between Europe and bringing the gospel to Africa and Asia? The answer is the power of Islam. Since the 600s, Islam had been a powerful empire, controlling most of the Middle East, controlling most of the trade routes between Europe and Asia, controlling North Africa, and controlling parts of Southern Europe, including most of Spain as well. This was the barrier. Now, as we get down into the 1400s, the Crusades are just very recent history at that time. In fact, during Columbus's lifetime, the popes were still calling for more Crusades against the Muslim forces that controlled the Holy Land. But arising in reaction to this, we have probably the fiercest Muslim force that had come up to that time, the Ottoman Turks. And in 1453, the Ottoman Turks capture Constantinople and the Eastern Roman Empire, which had stood for 800 years as a barrier protecting Europe from Muslim advance, suddenly collapsed. No wonder we hear Luther speaking about the need for God to deliver us from the Turk. The reaction in Europe was one of shudders, but also one of planning. Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal and others began laying plans for the establishment of what they called a worldwide Christian order, that is, Christianizing Africa, and Africa already had much more Christian influence than most of them realized, and Asia, 
so that they could have a united front against the power of Islam. And as Columbus joins in this discussion, he says, I agree. The only thing I have to add is, you want to reach Asia with the gospel? Best way to do it is sail straight west from Spain. Well, at first, they weren't very interested in doing that because Spain was involved in its own battle. Southern Spain, for hundreds of years, had been controlled by the Moors, Muslims, and only during Columbus's lifetime did northern Spain become united under Christians with the marriage of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And Ferdinand and Isabella had launched a crusade of their own a crusade to drive the Moors out of Spain. They finally succeeded. Finally, the Alhambra surrendered there at Granada in southern Spain on January 2nd, 1492. And then Ferdinand and Isabella turned to Columbus and said, okay, now what's this you were saying about sailing west to China? Now we're interested. And shortly thereafter, the expedition took place. Now, I'm not going to say that everything Columbus right, he made mistakes, and he did some things that can't be even excused as mistakes. I am saying that his basic motivation was to share the gospel. Listen to what he says in his entry here in his journal for October 12th, 1492. He says, I, in order that they might develop a very friendly disposition toward us, because I knew that they were a people who could better be freed and converted to our holy faith by love than by force, gave to some of them red caps and to others glass beads. They remained so much our friends that it was a marvel. I believed that they would easily be made Christians, because it seemed to me that they belonged to no religion. Four days later, in his entry for the 16th of October, he says, concerning the people he found on this island that he named San Salvador, or Holy Savior, probably Watling Island off the coast of Florida. He says, I don't recognize in them any religion. He didn't know the language, by the way. And I believe that very promptly they would turn Christians, for they are a very good understanding. Notice he's not saying these are a bunch of dummies and we can fool them. He's saying these are smart people. And if we can learn their language and share the gospel with them, they will become Christians. That was Columbus's overriding concern throughout his life. In fact, those who try to portray Columbus today, you find that there are basically two schools of thought. One portrays him as a phony who just simply spoke about the gospel and quoted scripture just because he had to to impress somebody. Not sincere at all. And the other is that he's a fanatic. He's a religious fanatic. Either way, we want to stay away from him. Well, I don't know, have you ever met an insincere fanatic? Can't have it both ways, I don't think. Again, mistakes were made, but the basic purpose of sharing the gospel is a noble one, and one that is very clear. Ferdinand Magellan is one who has always fascinated me because Ferdinand Magellan is sometimes referred to as the first man to sail around the world. Technically, that is not correct. He led what is, so far as we know, the first expedition ever to sail around the world. Magellan himself was killed on the expedition and did not complete it, but certainly he deserves credit for having led that expedition. But also concerning his role in evangelism, it's interesting the way modern accounts place him in a bad light. Listen to what World Book Encyclopedia has to say about Magellan. Magellan took special pride in converting many of the people to Christianity. Unfortunately, however, he involved himself in rivalries among the people. On April 27, 1521, Magellan was killed when he took part in a battle between rival Filipino groups on the island of Mactan. Now, technically, everything that they've said there is true, but they've put it with a very mean twist. Yes. He shared the gospel. Notice how they describe it. He took special pride in converting. It doesn't say that he desired to glorify God by preaching the gospel. It doesn't say he had a heart for souls, that he loved these people and wanted them to share eternal life. No, he just took pride in it. And unfortunately, he involved himself in rivalries, and he got himself killed. 
Again, technically true. Magellan had led a tribe of Filipino people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they had rejected their pagan ways. As a result, a larger pagan neighboring tribe was going to wipe that tribe out. Magellan's advisors said, let's get out of here. Magellan said, absolutely not. We led these people to Christ. We are responsible for their present danger. We have a duty to stand by them. And he did so, and he died a Christian martyr. Probably none of these explorers, though, have a worse reputation today than Hernando Cortez. I'm going to say flatly that I consider Hernando Cortez to be the most underrated man in the history of the Western Hemisphere. We talk about the conquest of Mexico. Well, did you ever stop to consider how it could be that Cortez, with an army of 500 to 550 men, managed to conquer an empire that was the most powerful military empire in the Western Hemisphere, an empire that some number as many as 30 million, a highly advanced technical civilization, a better sanitation system, better travel system than anything in Europe. Mexico City was a better fortified city than any city in Europe except possibly the Alhambra. Montezuma bragged that he had 30 vassal states that he had conquered, states that would produce for him 100,000 warriors at his immediate command. That's an additional 3 million soldiers in addition to his own Aztecs. A very advanced civilization, a very powerful military empire. How did Cortez do it? It certainly wasn't technology. Yes, he had 10 cannons, but these weren't modern howitzers. They were very primitive. He had 16 rifles with him, and these were not AK-47s or M-16s. They, too, were very primitive, just muskets. In fact, I call them rifles. That's a mistake. They were muskets. The main weapon they had was the sword. And the Spanish steel was stronger than the Aztec sword, which was made of wood and with an obsidian blade, but an Aztec warrior could cut the head off a horse with one blow with that sword. So they were a fearsome force indeed. How did Cortez do it? Either he's the greatest military genius the world has ever seen, and something has to be said for that. One thing about the Aztecs, they had special schools for military science, like the Army War College and things like that. They did not, however, seem to know how to translate their superior numbers into military advantage on the battlefield. Or a second possibility, he had some divine help. Or maybe there are some other things about the Aztecs that we are not being told today. I think the answer has to be a combination of all of these. What about the Aztecs? They believed in a religion of worshiping the sun god, and that religion was not only the source of their strength, it was also the cause of their downfall because they believed the sun god was involved in a cosmic conflict. You could call it Star Wars against the moon god and the star gods who had rebelled. And they believed that it was their duty to aid the sun god in his battle against the moon god. Now, how do you aid the sun god? Well, by giving him nourishment. What nourishment does he need? Well, in the view of the sun god's doctor, he had to be on a very restrictive diet, human blood. And so when you see those temples of the Aztecs in Mexico, as the historian John White said, we should envision them as they actually were, covered from top to bottom with a tacky crimson sheath of human blood. The sacrifices took place rather sporadically in the 1300s, and in the 1400s they accelerated into a major holocaust. In fact, in the year 1479, Montezuma's predecessor had dedicated a temple to the sun god and sacrificed between 20 and 30,000 human victims, mostly from the surrounding tribes. Cortez and his fellow soldiers, as they came through Mexico, they went to city after city, saw the Indian people in cages being fattened up to be sacrificed, set them free, in city after city, they'd see the temples and the piles of human skulls. On one, several of Cortez's officers 
calculated that this huge mound of skulls consisted of 150,000 human skulls. They were sickened by this. And in city after city that Cortez came to, he destroyed the idols, stood on the temple, and preached before crowds of hostile warriors the gospel of Jesus Christ. To show you the kind of courage this man had, one of the first things he did when he landed there at Veracruz, which he named, and it simply means True Cross, was to sink all 16 of his ships. That's his way of saying to his men, we are in this to the finish. And if we fail, there is no way of escape. There's another thing about Aztec religion, Central American religion, the belief in the god that they knew as Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, while the legends vary, appears to have been a Toltec god or Toltec king who had been forced to leave and who had sailed off to the east in a ship and swore that he would return to liberate his people. Well, the Aztecs, with their very advanced system of mathematics, had a very accurate calendar, and through various supposed visions that their priests and prophets had received, they calculated the year of Quetzalcoatl's return. Translating that to the European calendar, it was the year 1519, the very year that Cortez landed at Veracruz. Now, Cortez had never even heard of the Aztecs at this point. He had no idea that anything like Quetzalcoatl existed. But God knew it. And God, in his timing, brought all these events together so that when Cortez landed there in 1519, the Tlaxcalans and the Tabascans, the Toltecs, the Olmecs, and many other of these tribes looked at him not as a conqueror, but as a liberator. And when finally he surrounded Mexico City with an army of 200,000, only 500 of those were Spanish. The other 99 and 3 fourths percent were Native Americans simply wanting to be free of Aztec rule. Now, I'm not going to say that everything the Spanish did there was good. There was good and bad both. But let's understand the basic motivation, a motivation of sharing the gospel and of ending the abominations of human sacrifice. Now, if you believe that human sacrifice really has no particular moral significance, it's either pleasant or unpleasant, depending on which end of the knife you happen to be on, or if you believe that cannibalism is just a matter of dietary preference, then these things don't matter much. But if you believe there are absolute standards of right and wrong, then the significance of the way God used Columbus and Cortez to bring the principles of the Bible to this Western Hemisphere and to bring the gospel to this Western Hemisphere takes on a different significance. If you believe Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God and truly did die for the sin of the world, and that salvation for all eternity truly is available through him and only through him, then the significance of the way God used these flawed instruments takes on an eternal significance instead. But a question that we might ask as we look at this is, why did God choose to work through the English on the East Coast to bring about the principles that made this republic what it is. Why didn't he use the Spanish? Why, while the Spanish missions were being established on the West Coast, were constitutional provisions being hammered out on the East Coast? That'll be the subject of the next lecture.